Can everybody hear me better? Oh, well, I won't have to, I'll have a voice tomorrow too. Okay, let's talk about culture. Now that's what this was, we thought we were going to sort of focus on that in this workshop. How do we get a congregation to change its culture to be one of evangelism? Well, first of all, our evangelistic culture is based on clear biblical ideas, shared biblical language, and a coordinated biblical action. Not on convenience, uh, not on how comfortable or low risk it is. We don't put any emotional investment into it. Those kinds of things, what we've been talking about, indirect, to wait and see if someone else brings up Jesus. It's, you know, we like to keep people at arm's distance, arm's length, and sometimes we even make it sort of transactional. And by that I mean we say, I've done my part. You know, I've done what I'm supposed to do. And we put that, leave it there. And I call all that housekeeping religion. We're just keeping house. So how do we get the culture where it is, where we want to be successful every day, every minute of every day, we're trying to be successful? How does the congregation change to, to be that way? Here's your next question for your notebook. How can Pottsboro, Calero, Denison, or Sherman, whoever. Congregation of the Church of Christ in a small Texas or Oklahoma town shift from being inwardly focused, struggling, to being a fruitful, mission-based, evangelistic church. Write down just your four, top four or five ideas. What do you think? What's some ways you would change Would anybody here say your congregation's not struggling? Everybody I know is struggling. I'm just going to be honest. Just about. So how do we change that? How do we get mission-based, evangelistic, fruitful? What's some things we can do? Your ideas. If we have time, we might actually discuss some of those later. Probably not tonight. Our culture, evangelistic culture, is not determined by program and planned events. We're more than a social club uh, where we just meet our own emotional needs. Uh, are those programs and planned events necessary? Sure. Do they help? Sure. But it's not the culture. It's part of it. Yeah. Uh, impersonal interactions with the lost. Again, we try not to get really involved. We may have memorized something about the gospel, but our directions really have no, our efforts really have no direction. So our culture is that we just don't have one. It's not there. If you look at some of the larger congregations today, and we usually try to say it, blame it on population and all that, but that's not always true. If we just look at some of our larger congregations, we see some things about that they do maybe a little different than others. They're culturally sensitive. You know, they know their target audience, they adapt to it. Their worship is relative. They're sensitive about outreach. You know, I've heard one per person say, you can't be counterculture and grow. Well, I disagree with that, but you know, one guy said, you've got to study more sociology than theology. I disagree with that. You know, you've got to look at today's norms and values and morals and... Is that getting too loud? Okay. And, and technology. So, here's the caveat. We criticize those large congregations for that. And we, you know, maybe rightfully so. Because they're, they departed from the truth in a lot of ways. But we criticize them, and yet we're not working ourselves. We're not doing anything ourselves. So what determines the culture of a congregation? 
Well, it's the things which you place the highest value. We talked about that earlier. Bringing new people in should be what we place the highest value. How we do things, according to the scriptures. Unconscious assumptions that members make to drive their behavior. We all make some very wrong assumptions. And sometimes they're un unconscious. I mean, we don't even realize we're, we're making them. Let me give you a few. Preacher's supposed to do all the evangelism. That's what we pay him for. That's a wrong assumption. But yet we think that way sometimes. And people just aren't interested anymore. Well, that may be true on some scale, but it's not true for everybody. There's still people out there who are seeking, thirsting after righteousness. You know, people won't listen. Well, we assume that, but we don't know that. And so we don't try. And here's, what, you know, here's what I think is true for a lot of folks. I just attend. I just come. And they ought to be glad for that. You know, God's satisfied with that. Well, I don't think he is. And, you know, as long as we're, our number stays the same or some more people move in from the other congregation like we were talking, then we're growing. Those values and attitudes and behaviors that contribute to the unique and social psychological environment of the congregation is what determines our culture. If we value evangelism, if we think about evangelism, if we talk about evangelism, you know, if we contribute all our efforts to evangelism, that becomes our culture. Barna, I told you, was one of the researchers. He said the number two reason visitors return to a congregation a second time is due to the love the congregation shows to each other. Not show to the visitor, not show to him, the him, but what they observe, the love between the members of the congregation. What Christ say about that? How is he going to know his disciples? <coughs> love for each other. See, if we have that culture of love for each other and for the lost, it's visible. It becomes part of that culture. So evangelism has to start from within. It has to be this desire to reach out to lost souls. It has to be a clearly stated objective. Well, who's going to state it? Well, you know, the elders are going to state it. The preacher better state it. Each other, we need to state it to each other. That's why we, we're here. We want to do that. And we talked about it, create an environment that supports our efforts to it so that we can multiply and use our individual talents and efforts that we make it a priority that everyone understands their responsibility to share in it share in the lost that lessons on evangelism are highlighted and routinely taught if you go for weeks and months without ever talking about evangelism in your Bible classes in your sermons in your group studies or whatever that's not part of your culture then. And it's exemplified by the congregation's leader. We have to have top-down examples. Can't just say, you go do that. <laughs> and come back and tell me how it went. It's leading by example. And that visions and plans are routinely discussed and communicated. That this idea of reaching new people, we're always talking about it, communicating about it, talking to each other about it, what, what we've done, what we can do, 
what we should do, those kinds of things. So, to change a culture, you've got to change some minds. It's that simple. Right? We've got to get our minds changed. Starts with leadership, and I'm not getting on elders tonight, you know. I have a whole nother seminar on that where I get on them. <laughs> <laughs> if evangelism and winning souls is not modeled, you know, it's not an expectation of, the, of a congregation's mature Christians. You know, there's little modeling of it by leadership, <laughs> then we're not going to change any minds. We talked earlier about resources, you know, time, energy, and money. The average percent of money spent on things other than evangelism versus what is spent on evangelism. I told you it was five percent. Commitment and urgency. We can't keep putting it off. We can't keep procrastinating. We can't keep saying, "Well, it'll work itself out." It's not. Planning and prayer. I'm a big believer in planning. Most companies, you got to have some plans. Well, same thing with most organizations have to have some plans. Well, churches don't. We can't just wing it. We've got to have some plans, some direction. You know, evangelism can't be a secondary thought. have to pray about it. And we have to execute. We have to get out and do it. Uncertainty leads to inaction. <clears throat> Think about what I just said. Uncertainty leads to inaction. When we're uncertain about what we're supposed to be doing, and we're uncertain on how to do it, and we're uncertain where we're going with it, what's the easiest way? Let's just don't do anything. So we need to get certain. So we've got to change our minds. It's defined by our core value and behaviors. When someone says something about the lost, our radar ought to go up. When a person we've never seen before walks through the door, our radar ought to go up. When somebody on the street, we hear them talking about religion, radar ought to go up. Right? That's our core value. That's our behavior. We're looking for souls. And we have to align our strategies and, and the processes to do that. You can't outsource it. Now, you know, house to house, search TV, muscle and shuffle, those are all great things. Those are good things. They're helpful things. But they're not the thing. The thing is person to person. The thing is us getting out there and talking to folks. So when we talk about, you know, aligning strategies and processes, the process has to be, how do we get in contact with people? How do we talk to people? How do we show people the Bible? How do we study with someone? I can remember when I was a kid, and I'm not going to say how old my mother and dad are because they're sitting here, but I can remember I always used to hear about cottage meetings and Bible studies and things like that. And now we say, oh, those don't work. Why not? You know, have visible proponents and supporters. We talked about those MVPs. You've got to have people who are champions. People who are enthusiastic. They lead the charge. Hey, we're going to go save some souls today. Come on. Don't see many folks like that, but we sure need them. We set goals and we measure them. You mean I should set a goal on how many people I should talk to? Why wouldn't you? <coughs> you think in that sales organization, I said, we don't have any goals. We'll just sell what we can sell. We'll just do the best we can. You know? No, I had a thermometer up there that said, here's the goal, here's where we're at, here's where we're going. We're ahead or behind. 
What should we be measuring? Number of baptisms. That's one. What else? Number of studies. Number of studies. You know you're not going to baptize everyone you study with. Right. <coughs> People we contact. Number of contacts. Engagements. I mean visitors. Visitors. So if we look at these things, you know, we're back to that urgency versus complacency. You know, we've got to understand what's motivating us or not motivating us. We're going to talk about that in our last session. And I got out of here, don't rush it. And you're saying, wait a minute, you already told us it was urgent, and then you're telling us not to rush it. <laughs> no, what I mean is we've got to rush the effort. It's urgent to start the effort. But once we start it, we've got to be careful and patient on how we do it. Right? And so this whole idea is that we get better all the time. Japanese have a word for this called Kaizen. It means continually improving. So we need to be continually improving in our evangelistic effort. We ought to be better at it this week than we were last week. And so we've got to change our minds in the way we think about it, in the way we look at it. You know, young people are interesting. Yeah, young people, yeah. Church of Durant this week is having a seminar on young people evangelism. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew casting a net into the sea, and they were fishermen. And Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. These two guys were already professional fishermen, right? They knew all about fishing. But Jesus said, I'm going to make you, you're going to become. Jesus says, I'm going to train you. You're going to learn from me how to do it. Now, I'm going to give you the skill and this art of fishing for men. You ever think like a fish? Mark, you ever think like a fish? Why would you think like a fish? I find out where they are in the water. That's right. i got to think like a fish so I can catch him, right? I wonder where that fish is. I bet he'd be over there under that shade tree. I bet he'd like that worm instead of that plastic thing there I had. You know, we got to think like a fish. And Jesus said, you're going to become fishers of men. I'm going to get you to think like the fish. I know you know how to catch a fish, but I'm going to teach you how to catch a man. You're going to get trained in it, how to do it. You yourselves know, this is Paul talking to the Ephesian elders. You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and tears and trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and the Greek of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at those words he used there, declare, teach, testify. Those were definitive actions, right? Those were things he did. He didn't say, I'm going to think about it. It wasn't some passive thing I'm just going to think about. He said, I opened my mouth. And I declared and I taught and I testified. And I did it in public and I did it from house to house. In other words, I did it every opportunity. A lot of people, one person. It didn't make any difference. I did that. Jews and Greeks. Everybody. All the world. Every creature. I was willing to do that. So when we talk about winning or a revival of a person to commitment to Christ, and this is we're defining evangelism here. We use the word soul winning, right? You've heard people say, he wants to be would sing a song, I want to be a soul winner. Well, that means we have an opponent. That means we're trying to win over our opponent. Well, who's the opponent? Everybody's shaking their head. Nobody's saying anything. Satan. Satan of the world. You know, he's trying to win souls too. 
So we're in a competition. Our goal is always conversion. Our goal is to win that person to Christ. So the if definition is the spreading of the gospel news by pub, or the gospel by public preaching, publishing, or personal conversations. And the practice is to relay that information to a particular set of beliefs to others with the intention of converting them, of conversion. Other definitions, the Greek definitions, the story of God saving his people and judging his enemies by sending Jesus Christ. It's the good news. It's to preach it. It's to, evangel to be an evangelist. One who declares the good news, the bringer of good news. You know, bringing significant news, especially God's act of salvation, what he's done. It is literally God's story, that good news. So we're to be bringers of it. Now, I can't bring it if I don't tell it. I can't bring it if I don't say it. Yeah. And Jesus came and spoke to them, All authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. I was talking about daily mission. There it is. That's the daily mission. Make disciples. Company's got to have a product. Got to manufacture something. What's ours? We make disciples. You know, we take a raw material and make something out of it. We take a lost soul and make a disciple out of it. You can't make something out of nothing. Evolutionists say you can, but you can't. Can't make something out of nothing. Well, we have something. We have all these nations. All these people. We can make disciples. And he says baptize. Baptize who? The disciples, the people we're making disciples, the people we're getting to want to learn about Jesus. The people we're teaching about Jesus. And so they continue in that. And so he said, the teaching is ongoing. Teach them to observe all, everything I've commanded. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. You remember in Acts chapter 3 and 4, Peter and John are out walking around, going to the temple, and they heal, heal a guy and things like that. What were they doing out there? Intermingling. Yeah. They were coming in contact with people. They were out there telling people about that. When Paul was making all those trips, going through all those towns and all those different journeys, what was he doing out there? Telling people the good news. Telling the people the good news. When Philip chased that chariot, remember he ran after it. What was he doing? Telling someone the good news. Preach to him Jesus. See, we've got to find places to go. What does he say? Go into all the world? We've got to find places to go. Now sometimes that's going to Africa. But sometimes that's going across the street. All went to the synagogues. Went to the synagogue. You know. There are places that make sense to go. Clara Church supports a missionary in New Zealand. And some of you may have met him. Uh, his name's Chris Hurd. Chris, I was reading one of his newsletters the other day. He got the permission from a denominational group to come in and speak to him. And he took it, as he should have. What do you think he went in there and told him? You're okay. We're You're okay. okay. We're okay. No. Chris went in and told him the truth. Chris went in and told him about Jesus Christ and what they needed to do for salvation. And they invited him back. And he's been back several times. And he has high hopes for that. You know, we got to find places to go and reasons to go. Even if it's just across that back fence. To intentionally 
preach the gospel. And when he's talking about preaching the gospel here, he's not talking about that pulpit back there. We can get up and talk to other people. And he says, he who believes, believes what? Anything? Whatever? That which was preached. That which was preached. Who Christ was, who he is, what he will do. He says, then that person will be saved. Baptized will be saved. So evangelism is defined by the message. It's not the method. It's not the medium. It's not the occasion. It's not the audience. It's the opportunity to tell the message. It's the opportunity to teach and preach, teach and preach everything about Jesus Christ. It's a performance command. You know what a performance command is? A herald. Herald. Performance command is this, this simple. Get it done. Get it done. Now, I'm going to leave it up to you how to get it done, but you get it done. I don't care what you got to do as long as it's within these guidelines. You have the liberty to use your brain that you come in the door with to get it done. Maybe it is the newspaper. Maybe it is on TV. Maybe it is Facebook. Maybe it is across the back fence. Whatever. Just get it done. We choose the most effective method. He gives us that brain power to decide what's the most effective method. So when we talk about a culture, we all work together in deciding how to get that done. We all think about it together. We all look at it and say, here's the good news. How are we, as this group of people, best, most effectively, spread this good news? If we never talk about it, if we never discuss it, if we never sit down and plan, if we never figure out what we're going to do, guess what happens? What happens, Charlie? Nothing. Nothing. And God says, you better go. Right? You better preach. That's the performance. But he says, I'm going to leave it up to you how to do it. Jesus went to the cross to pay the debt for our sins. That's the great news. That's the good news, right? What's the bad news? Punishment. Punishment. You know, there is some bad news. Jesus was buried and he rose again in three days. That's terrific news. Because of what he did, we have the opportunity to be forgiven, saved, put in the right relationship with God, hope of eternal life. You know, that's the gospel. That's how simple it is. That's what we should be telling people. We don't need a 10-page manual. I handed you one, but you didn't need it. We know the good news, and we know the bad news, so we can do it. It's the story of Jesus Christ. It's that simple. You know, who he is, what he's done, our access to him through the scriptures, our response in faith and obedience, and it is communicated to us as believers and non-believers with the purpose of making believers. Paul said, I delivered unto you, first of all, as I received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Oh, but wait a minute. All roads lead to, to God, do they not? My truth is different than your truth, but it's still my truth. What's wrong with that? I'm not really a religious person, so I don't really get into that. We come up with things like that. Christians, I know, they're not really like Jesus. I don't know what that's about. See, we have to get out there and say, here's what the gospel truly is. It's not my truth, your truth. It's the truth. You know, all, lead, all roads don't lead to God. It's only through his name that man is saved. It's his, what he's done. 
that gives us that entrance into heaven. Clarence DeLoach wrote this, evangelism is the combined influences brought to bear upon leading a soul to Christ. Combined influences. You know, if I went out and I found someone or some, you know, somehow I had a contact with someone and I spent all week long presenting the gospel to them, teaching them about the things, invite them to church and they walk in the door and they hear something different. They see something different. They're treated badly. What happened? But on the other hand, if I spend all week telling somebody the good news, and they walk in, and other people are talking about the good news, and we treat that person as a friend, and we're concerned about that person, we give reasons for the hope that is within us. We work together as a congregation, put all our resources into it. Whatever that person needs, we're going to help. Then we're combining our influence, and that's what it takes. That's where culture comes in. I've told this story to several of you, and I know you've heard it, but I'm going to tell it again because I think it would make a great illustration of this. Lady I was discussing the scriptures with, been studying with a little bit, casually talking about religion at lunch and things like that. And kept inviting her to come to services. She never would come. But then one Sunday, unbeknownst to me, she lived just down the block from a congregation, and I'm not going to call any names. And she went to that congregation that morning. I didn't know it. Monday morning, she couldn't wait to come to my office and say, hey, I went to church yesterday. So I said, well, really, where? You know, you didn't come where I was at. And she goes, oh, I went to this congregation. I said, what do you think? That's not church. I said, why not? She said, well, they had, instead of a preacher, they had a guy get up and talk about retirement planning. Financial advisor. See, what happened to the combined influence? My influence was gone. What I'd been working on was gone. You know, I had to start over again. Everything we do, the whole culture, should be pointed towards evangelism. You know, if it's our Bible classes, if it's our fellowship, if it's the money we use, if it's our leaders, if it's our worship, everything, and we can add others to this, all should point to evangelism. If it doesn't help bring a soul to Christ, why are we doing it? And companies talk about limited resources. You can't do everything because you don't have the resources to do everything. So you try to do the things you're supposed to do. Same way with the congregation. We all have limited resources. We have a limited time. We have limited effort. We have limited money. All of that's limited. Why wouldn't it all be focused on evangelism? You know, all efforts have some connection to it. That's our daily mission. Five out of every hundred at our Sunday morning worship service should be visitors that were brought in due to our evangelistic efforts. Think about that. Five out of every hundred at our Sunday morning worship should be people that we brought in due to our evangelistic efforts. I would dare say none of us have that ratio. One out of four of our visitors should, should become... One out of four of our visitors should become permanent within one year of visiting the first time. We should have social events and that events are things that where we can connect with people at least every quarter. Seven out of ten in worship should have also been in Bible class. Now I think it should be ten out of ten, but David Hamrick says seven, so we'll go with his number. One dollar out of every twenty should be invested in local evangelism. So the mission is essential. It's this combined influence. 
It's making use of everybody's contact. I read of some congregations that start programs like this and they'll say, everybody write down five or six contacts, five or six, seven, whatever. And then they just make one master list and they get after it. Let's go to work. You know. Prospects, using everyone's abilities, using our assemblies. People come to worship and again, I'm not being critical <laughs> of anybody. But what do you do if you come to a worship service and there's no zeal in that worship? There's no enthusiasm in that worship. You know, people barely get through the song service. They sleep while Travis is preaching. You know, things like that. What happens? They don't believe in what they're doing. Right. We've again lost our influence. We're links in the chain, and we're going to have to, to make teaching the gospel effective. We have to cultivate an environment where people want, want to be there, bearing fruit. That's what we're told to do. It's that simple. A certain man had a fig tree planted in a vineyard. He came seeking fruit. I keep echoing myself here. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I've come seeking fruit of this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also, till I dig around it and fertilize it, and if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that you can cut it down. What's this talking about? It's talking about maximizing our effort to bear fruit putting everything we can into it, but also being patient with the process until it happens. But don't stop. I planted, all this water, God gave the increase. See, we need planters, we need waterers, we need reapers. That's the combined influence. That's taking everyone, that's the culture. Mid McKnight, preacher from the last century, one person talking to another person about his need for the salvation found only in Jesus Christ with the purpose of bringing him to a decision. You want to know what evangelism is? There it is. Talking to another person about salvation with a purpose. What? Bringing them to a decision. What's talking? Where's my wife? Where's talking? <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble for that. What's talking? Words coming out Verbal. of your mouth. Verbal. Right? A conversation with a purpose. Proactive. Ephesians 6 and 19, Paul prayed that he could open his, vo his mouth boldly. I want to be able to talk to you. Now some people just aren't big talkers. Some people are introverts. Some people are extroverts, right? What do you think I am? Extra. No. I got tested. They told me I'm an introvert, but I fake being an extrovert. <laughs> well, that's what we got to do. We've got to sometimes, even though we want to be quiet and listen, we've got to talk. We've got to become extroverts and say, hey, you need to make a decision. Clayton Pepper says, it's not evangelism until the lost are confronted with the gospel. A confrontation usually has a very negative connotation, right? We don't like to be confronted. But what's this talking about? Face to face. Put the gospel in their face. Purpose of making a decision. Hey, here's the death, burial, and resurrection right here. No tricks, no deceit, very direct. Confront. Give them enough information they can make a wise decision. I had a uh, young man come to my door last week, knock on the door, had his tie on. I could tell he was from a church that's down the street from us, not too far. Handed me a card. Will you take my card? I said, sure. Really, because I just want to see what happened to the card. We take my card. 
And the first thing he asked me was, actually the second thing, second thing he asked me was, if you die tonight, where will you, will you go to heaven? Pretty confrontational, right? The timing was wrong. That's not the time and place to ask that question. But he was confronting me with that. Well, his, I think it was his mother. He was all dressed out. His mother had on a NASCAR shirt, and she was standing behind him. <laughs> And when I started quoting some scripture, it was like, come on, <laughs> come on, this guy knows too much, let's go. <laughs> but, you know, you get the idea. Give people enough information to make a decision, a wise decision. Convince the need to respond to the gospel. Confront. See, we're, we're, we have a fear of doing that. Why? Why do we get timid? Yeah. But they may not like me if I put it if I say that. I may lose some lose a friendship over that. Well you're not. Con confrontation can be done correctly. We're not saying do it in a mean way. We're just saying present it. Where they have to make a decision with it. Evangelism is not complete until the evangelized become the evangelist. This is the main part of an evangelistic culture. We all were evangelized at one point, were we not? Somebody taught us the good news. Someone shared it with us. So we have to be activated to share it with others. Commitment, act of kindness and service, inviting people to, to come and listen, Bible studies together, positive attitudes, teaching continually. That's what evangelism is. So ne next question in your notebook. Are you intimidated by the prospect of talking to people about spiritual things? Again, honest answer, just you, for your consideration. Are you intimidated by the prospect of talking to people about spiritual things? Here's what Paul says. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Paul said, I was a little scared. You know, I, had, I was fearful to the point of trembling. And I didn't even use plausible words. But I wasn't quiet. He said, I decided to know nothing among you but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The simple message of the gospel. Kevin Moore said, people will not come to God unless we go to them. And once we've done our part, no matter how humble or inept that might be, as long as the truth has been presented, nothing more is expected. God can work through you and save people despite your imperfections. The only way to fail at evangelism is not to even try. We have to try, but we have to do better. Another study said, here's the things that people dislike about their first time visit at a Church of Christ. Pretty good research. Hmm. Okay, preachers, cover your ears. <laughs> the first thing they didn't like was boring and irrelevant sermons. Second thing, unfriendly members. Third thing, emphasis on things they didn't care about. You know, it's hard for someone to come in, and that's sometimes timing. You know, they come in and, and great, got a great lesson on the Lord's Supper, well, they don't understand the Lord's Supper. You know. But just emphasis on the wrong things they don't care about. 
And the fourth one is a physical thing. Poor child care facilities. They didn't have a place for their baby. That's the things visitors dislike. A successful soul winning effort must start by laying a foundation of preaching and teaching that deals with why we don't share our faith and hope. Exterior versus interior barriers, self-imposed, you know, people just aren't interested anymore. Somebody said a while ago, fear of rejection. I'm not comfortable saying anything. You know, it's pretty uppity of me to tell somebody they're wrong. That's not good for me to tell somebody they're you know, in a bad relationship with God. Who am I to tell somebody in judgment they're going to be in eternal punishment? See, we fear that. So it's a lack of training and instruction. <coughs> We're not opportunity and prospect conscious. One of the things salespeople are taught is like, hey, you're walking through the woods, you've got all the trees, but you're looking for a squirrel, right? So you've got to learn where to look. You've got to be conscious. I hear it. I see something. I see looking. what to look for. We're not opportunity and prospect conscious. People give us signs and signals, maybe in their speech, in their conversation about religion. You know, and sometimes we can prompt that and get that started, but we've got to be clued in. Here's my chance. Some people are good at that. Here's my chance to talk about Jesus. Sometimes it's due to our lack of joy in our own salvation. We know we've got problems, and so we're, that takes priority. And we talked about earlier this lack of modeling and mentoring. So we got to talk about why we're not doing it sometimes as well as why we should do it. Again, David Hamrick said, trying to evangelize our community without adequate preparation and planning is like running a marathon without training. You may or may not complete the race, but one thing is for sure, you would have run a much better race had you adequately prepared. Evangelism is too important not to give it our best effort. New Testament uses the word diligence, right? Often. Often. What does diligence mean? Extra effort. Best effort. That best effort. And so, you know, it's too important for us not to give it the best effort. If we're going to be diligent Christians, we give it our best effort. And it's this culture, this joint effort of everyone doing what contributes to winning souls. Planning and preparation. Jesus' apostles were with him for how long? Three years. What did they learn in that three years? Not to say I'm first. Yeah. <laughs> they learned... How to go and preach. They learned how to teach and make disciples. So when he left them with those commands, they knew what to do. And so do we. Okay, we're going to end up here. So we need to look at this. How do we improve our culture? Well, we have to ask ourselves where are we at right now. That's why I asked you earlier, did you, did you think your congregation was evangelistic? And did you think it was effective at being evangelistic? Where are we at right now? You know the answers to that. Where will we be if we follow our, pre follow our present path? If our culture doesn't change, are we going to be okay? Where do we want to be? Can we develop some way to reach that goal? What resources are we going to need to get there? Who's going to carry out this plan? What are we going to need to implement it to get it started? When will we know if we achieve it? See, these are joint decisions that a congregation needs to make together. Led by their leaders, led by the elders. You know, strategic planning is a science of learning how to 
plan something out and all the steps that go into making it happen, the who, what, when, where, how kind of things. Can't we do that with evangelism? Yeah. Can't we put something on the board that says, here's our plan? Can't you make one for yourself and say, here's my plan for me? And I'm going to throw this in here. I was on preachers a while ago for their boring sermons. When a congregation can keep their minister over seven years, they become four times more effective at evangelism. A lot of people think it's the opposite of that. You know, that they get burnt out, that they stay too long, and we need some new blood. Numbers show different. Congregations who can keep a preacher for up to seven years are four times more effective at bringing in new folks than congregations who lose the preacher routinely. Why do you think that is? Because you're starting over. Yeah. Every time. Preachers build up influence. Get known in the community. Those kinds of things. Okay, last question, then we'll, we'll quit here for tonight. Well, I got two questions, actually. <laughs> if you were to enter a town where the gospel has never been heard and you wanted to bring the lost to Christ, how would you begin? Well, I see you all are writing real fast. <laughs> Open my house up and invite someone to come. Yeah. How would you begin? Maybe that's the way. I don't know. I'm asking for you to put your ideas down. See? Somebody a while ago said we start over. Well, sometimes we need a reset button. We need to start over. We need to say we got a green field here. Let's start over. What's the common cry on a lot of things? That's the way we've always done it. Don't change that. Wait a minute. We have services at 9.30. None of this 10 o'clock stuff, 9.30. Yeah, we think more people that come at 10 o'clock. I don't care, 9.30. <laughs> now I use that as a facetious example, but that's the kind of thing we get into sometimes. Next one. Water, who was responsible for you first coming to know about Jesus and the church? And we all had that. Maybe it was our family. Maybe it was a preacher. Maybe it was a friend. Who was it? Or what was it that was responsible for you coming to know Jesus? Now, why would I ask you that question? Because I got the answer. 79% say it was a friend. That's a very high percent compared to the other ones, right? The rest of them are in single digits. Does that say we shouldn't have gospel meetings, we shouldn't have programs, we shouldn't have Bible classes? No, it just says the most effective way is for us to talk to our friends and neighbors. That's the culture we need to create. So when we look at all these different things, and this is what we're going to look at tomorrow, you know, public information, Christian living, conversational evangelism, ministry evangelism, friendship evangelism, teaching the, the gospel, but it all points to that center circle of converting people to Christ. That's how we create this evangelistic culture. Everyone contributing to each one of those circles, involvement, participation, Paul used the term by all means. See, we try to be restrictive. We only do what we like to do. So don't leave your brain at the door. Get ready to work. Okay? We have more tonight, but I can tell I'm losing you, so. <laughs> Carl's, we're way past Carl's bedtime. Please be back in the morning at 9 o'clock. We're going to talk about, we're going to get into the nitty gritty of what you can do, how you can do it, what you can say, what you should say, those kinds of things tomorrow.